Firstly, before I start, I just want to do a few thank yous. Um, I'd like to thank Emma Hand and AgriFutures. Um, Emma's been fantastic and she's, and AgriFutures themselves have obviously allowed us to give a scholarship to myself and um, study these tile drains, um, which is a very important part of our farming future. Um, but they've also included me in a lot of their projects. So at the moment I'm working with AgriFutures on a, on a completely separate project, which is about uh, subclover harvesting and, and trying to make a 1970s machine work in the, the 2025 era. Um, special thanks to Jody Nicola and welcome to Tatum and Cherie. You guys have a massive task of trying to uh, herd 24 cats into one place this year. Um, Rob Bradley and the board of Nuffield Australia and the people that sit on various committees across Australia volunteering their time and giving back to all of us. Uh, at the moment there, is a, there was 97 scholars that travelled this year so far and there's 60 that were on a GFP last month. That is a, a phenomenal amount of people to get organised and move around the world. So thank you very much. Brian McAlpine, I'm sure you don't feel you've done very much, but you're always contactable. I can, I can ring you and you can give me some great guidance, some corrections where needed. And um, Andrew Fayala and the Cox brothers for the lovely big shove they gave me. Uh, my mum and dad for holding the fort and, and looking after our 14 staff and um, paying all the bills. Something I kind of forgot about that someone has to pay the bills while I'm away. Um, and lastly, my wife, Kelly. For those that have met Kel, you know how lucky I am. Um, and you know how understanding she really must be. Um, it's not the first time I've up and left her. The last time I did this, I left her with a five-week-old baby, a two and a four-year-old. It wasn't popular. Apparently, leaving her with two teenagers this time was worse. Right, so a bit about me. Um, Fourth generation small seed farmer. Um, with my wife, we manage three separate but very vertically integrated businesses. Um, both my parents are recently experimenting with retirement, which is interesting. Um, we run a uh, board of directors and what we do there is for them, it keeps the farm transparent and they can see what's going on all the time. So if anyone doesn't have one of those and they've got parents in succession, it's a really great thing. Um, with three children, uh, Riley, who's 15, he's off to India to play cricket in a week's time um, with the International Cricket School, so he's doing very well. Uh, Scarlett, who's doing her first maths exam today, so she's just as nervous as I am. And um, Miller, who won her 5-6 grand final on Friday night in hockey, so she did really well. Um, but briefly about our agribusinesses. Uh, m and Bell is the farming side of the business. Uh, it consists of 3,500 acres of small seed production, mainly being grasses and clovers, um, with a few forage cereals. The cattle business will trade around 1,500 to 2,000 cattle a year, um, both, mostly being grazed on our, on our grass seed crops. Um, and Bell Pasture Seeds, that's it going there with the cats and the forklifts. Um, it's 10,000 square metres, seed grading, packing facility, automated lines. Um, it's, we aim to sell about 2,500 tonnes of pasture seed a year. We buy it and grow it all over the world, so um, it's, it's quite a large business, it's the largest in Western Australia, it's definitely one of the largest purchases of pasture seed across Australia. So, um, and then WA Honey Farms, which is my hobby. Um, it's a small apiary, about 80 hives, um, we grow hybrid canola for BASF, and uh, we mostly use that for the, the pollination side of things. Um, if you've ever handled bees, you'll know you answer your mobile phone at your own peril. Right. So it's a fantastic bit of downtime. Now there's three things you need to know about Western Australia's farming community and farming areas. It never rains up north, it always rains down south, and it's not the, uh, not the mining money that keeps us afloat, it's the uh, Esperance farmers' tax returns. Um, you know, where we farm is 200 kilometres south, that way. Um, it's a small, flat coastal plain, um, and it is a true Mediterranean climate. So when you think about Mediterranean, don't necessarily think about the south of Western Australia, do you? Um, it's, it's warm and wet in winter, and it's hot and dry in summer. Uh, as, a, as a trial, we, start, we installed about eight to nine hectares 
of slotted pipe about a metre down underground to get rid of our excess water. Um, you see a couple of graphs there. That just shows our constant temperatures and our rainfall. If you look carefully, our current rainfall is 400 millimetres. It is the lowest it's ever been for this time of year. So we're technically in drought and it's the best year we've had in ages. I'll just, uh, I'll just play this bit of media quickly. Um, it really highlights why we're doing this. G'day, Rob Bell, uh, Bell Seeds. Just gonna show you a bit of drainage stuff we're doing. A little bit different, a uh, little bit experimental. Um, yeah, so we're just having a go at trying to get our paddocks a bit dry and, and keep that anaerobic growth going underneath. So what we've got here is uh, our traditional drainage. So we use spoon drains. Um, they're done with a scraper and a laser. Um, they're, they're very, very accurate because the, the scraper is obviously laser guided. So you can see there's one running up there back to the paddock to drain all that water at the back and then one coming through from the paddock next door wanders down this way and out into the big drain you can see our surface water laying on top that's reasonably deep through the drain i've just had for a little drive through it so you get an idea of um, what's happening average year we're hitting bang on 500 mil now it's about middle of july it is the middle of july here's our uh, traditional ab lines we use so 24 meter control traffic lines for spraying spreading. This is pretty typical of our paddocks. This is a uh, grass seed crop that the cattle have just come out of a couple of days ago. Um, it says a little bit hungry for nitrogen, but that's pretty right for this time of year. We're pretty happy with this. Um, anyway, so I'll just cruise through here. And just up here, we did some um, tile drainage. So we put drainage under the ground, it's a meter down. Um, it's laid again with a laser. Uh, it's got a little bit of aggregate on top and I reckon you'll see where we start getting into the area because all of a sudden it changes from that to this so here's our here's our drainage we're just coming up to our first uh, drain it's um they're spaced in between our AB line so there was an AB line just there and just here in the middle uh, you can see a little bit of water laying on top with the clay. This is our first tile drain. Right. So, three things you can take away from that. The sound of my boots walking across that ground and how wet it actually is. How much damage a ute does to my paddocks. Just a ute. Imagine what you do with a full spreader. Um, and the, the third thing there is, I was 10 kilos lighter prior to my GFP. <laughs> Well, I have to tell you, it's 12.3, actually. Not, 0.3 is getting specific, isn't it, really? Um, so, obviously, the potential's there. It was, it's the great potential's there. So now I needed to know more about this. I needed to know what we were actually doing. I needed to know what we were exporting, um, you know, what long-term effect it would have. Um, would it last? You know, was it just going to silt up and, and be useless the following year? Um, so travel took me uh, to... Willamette Valley in Oregon, um, North and South Islands of New Zealand. Uh, during, during, actually, that was right during the COVID bubble. Remember, we had that lovely bubble between New Zealand and, and Western Australia. And I flew back in. As I flew back in, this, um, well, I actually got down the freeway. The Australian Federal Police rang me and told me to turn around and come back, which I ignored. Um, but it was okay. Uh, Japan, Ireland, California, Kununurra. Thank you very much, Fritz. Um, and, but by the far, the most valuable time I spent was in, in Iowa, Des Moines, or Des Moines, Iowa, um, and their surrounding counties where, where everything, like seriously, everything is toll drained. Um, so, being, um, when, I, when I actually looked around and had a look at everything, these were some of the major highlights I took away from it. Um, we're gonna go through a lot of these in a second. Um, the, the big major thing that came out of it was major land use change, okay? When, when we, as you saw in that video, when we do these things to these paddocks, it completely changes what you can do. Being the farmer I am, the first place I start is machinery. Um, so this was actually the Farm Progress Show in Boone. Um, and I was, I was there and um, it, was, it was fairly important for me to find a a way that we could put the pipe in the ground at a cost-effective price because the trial cost me nearly between between four thousand and six thousand dollars a hectare, depending on what I did. Okay, at that price, I can't do the thousand hectares I want to do. It's just not not viable. I'm better off buying another farm. 
not one in Esperance, but another farm. Um, so I went around and had a good look at things. You'll see up there in the top left, that's what they call a linkage tile plough. That's actually mine. I bought it on the day when I saw it. That is the, the third tile plough to be bought into Western Australia. Um, and that was, oh, that was nearly 18 months ago. Uh, as of now, Sawmax have sold 25 of them into here. Okay, give you an idea of the uptake. Um, we also met with, uh, at the field days, I was, the agri drain were quite a, kind enough to spend a bit of time with me, um, and we actually talked to them about pipe. Now, it's all well and good being able to put it in the ground sheet, but the cost of the infrastructure is too expensive. Well, that's what happens. And the pipe we first started with, even not so long ago, was about $4.50 to $4.80 a metre, and, and that's quite expensive. Um, Agri-drain, we can land it into my yard in in the plains or Capel or Boynup or wherever you want to call it today, uh, but for about two dollars fifty a metre in nine hundred metre rolls, um, and that's that's starting to get to a price where I'd be comfortable tile draining my farm. Um, I'm working on about twenty four metres, as you've seen. That's about a thousand dollars a hectare, so it starts to become really quite viable for me. Let's move up to these pipe choices. We keep keeping the theme of pipes. Um, when a strange little Middle Eastern man comes running up to you and grabs you with two hands and says, come and look at my pipe, you think, what the hell is going on here? And Hassan did that. Um, he's a fantastic guy at, at MSU. Um, He's a researcher and he's been doing a lot of work on pipes, okay? Now, some of it's pretty obvious. Um, some of it's fairly obvious because, I mean, quite obviously, more perforations, the more water can get in. It stands to reason, doesn't it? Um, and then, when we move on, this isn't so obvious. When we start getting sandy soil types, and in Western Australia we have sandy soil types, even some of our heavy clays are still classed as a sandy soil type to these pipe manufacturers. Okay, a normal sand slot pipe, we, we close the, the slot up a bit to stop the sand getting in. Um, but when we start wrapping the sock in fabric, which costs us a dollar a metre more, uh, we can see that it's nearly six times the amount of infiltration into these pipes. So Hassan was great. He was very practical about his research. Um, he also spent a lot of time explaining aggregate to me because every time a contractor would talk to me about aggregate, depending on what machine he had, it was a necessity or didn't need it. Whereas the researcher, Hassan in this case, he said to me, Rob, it's really simple. Um, if you've got a trenching machine, it cuts a trench down and square and flat in the bottom. Okay? These guys will always want aggregate because their pipe is round sitting in a square trench. The pipe doesn't have any support, so therefore the soil drops on top of it and crushes the pipe. We have problems, okay? Um, a tile plough is different. So a, a tile plough, the difference is we drag the point through the ground like a really big DBS, and it creates a more angular bottom. So now the pipe's supported on all three sides. Did you understand how that works? Yep. So. Basically, depending on what machine you're using is probably one of the big considerations for aggregate. Because if you've used aggregate, uh, Rob Bradley and I were talking about this the other night, it is a very expensive part, to, a very expensive part of the infrastructure. It is also really hard to get good clean aggregate and it adds a lot of complication. Most of the contractors agreed it was a hell of a lot easier just to add more pipes at a closer spacing than it was to add aggregate. I was very lucky uh, that at the same time in Iowa, when I was planning my trip to Iowa, that I planned it to go to the 11th International Drainage Symposium. Um, it was one, a week long event with every expert on water drainage across the whole world was there and all the largest contractors. So you had, it's like this room here, you had so much expertise in one place, okay? I walked in there and I was the only farmer. There was no other farmers in the room. Um, so I kind of felt like, well, extremely intimidated, um, but also I was certain I was the least knowledgeable 
least knowledgeable, least knowledgeable person on toll drainage in this whole room, or on that whole room. That all changed when the keynote speaker, Rob Burtonshaw, he stood up there and the first thing he said is, I'd like to welcome Rob Bell from Nuffield, Australia. Rob Burtonshaw is a 2012 Nuffield Scholar. He also did it on toll drainage. From that point, it's amazing how quickly doors open. We've all been there and how the doors all open for us and everything just came. Um, it was fantastic. The major focus of the symposium wasn't about putting it in because they're already experts at that. It was all about nutrient management, um, you know, what water and stuff was coming out. Right, Dave Cox, every presentation has a graph. This may be a bit of a shock to my GFP group, but after I left the symposium, I became very environmentally conscious of what I was letting go. Andrew, Andrew Fowler's laughing at me because he knows me. Um, <laughs> and what was, really, what was really good is the West Australian Department of Water put out a heap of sensors and we tested our water all the time. And we did it twice a month and we come up with this big set of data here. Um, what's really great about it um, is when we look at phosphorus, and I live in the Geograph Bay, it's very sensitive to phosphorus, okay? We can see that it's not leaching out our groundwater, it is going across our open paddock drains, but it's certainly not coming out of our subsoil drains. So we have absolutely mitigated our phosphorus runoff. That's pretty fantastic, and that's the big story I'm going with. <laughs> because you can all see the next graph in the problem. Nitrates, okay? It's in the groundwater, it's sitting there, it's not coming out the paddock runoff, it's not in the open drain before the trial, it's certainly in it after, and it's definitely coming out the subsoil drains. So nitrate is becoming a big problem. And at this point, I started to get really worried because I'd been to Ireland and I had seen what those poor Irish dairy farmers are going through trying to contain nitrates. But it's not all bad, because at the symposium, we learned about all these tools for managing uh, nitrate. And actually I spent a full day with Matt Helms and Matt's another researcher and he volunteered to take me out after the symposium, so it was lovely of him. Um, and we went and looked at all these different ways of managing nitrates. The first one there is a bioreactor, and you can, you can see it up the top there. Um, now, bioreactors, they're not that complicated. They just use wood chips, and so you add nitrate to a carbon source, feeds the microbes, turns your nitrate into nitrogen gas. 76% of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas. Great, until they run dry. And in my climate, they will run dry because I get hot and more well, hot and dry through summer, so they run out of moisture. At that point, they turn into large methane producers. Not so good. I've got 2,000 methane producers, didn't need another one. <laughs> Oxbows and wetlands. Um, it's just a wetland. It is, a, it is where the creek has moved over time and straightened. Okay, so if you have a look in all our precision farming that we do now, we will straighten creek lines and waterways to make sure we can farm our nice GPS line. So where that was, these guys are turning those into a wetland because they're already fairly wet country or like a big, um, well, just like a big wetland, like a big swamp. And they use that to pour the toll drain water over and it takes out the nitrate naturally by growing grasses, okay? Suits some people. Drainage corridors, much the same, flowing down a paddock. Um, saturated buffers, I think this has the most promise because this is a saturated buffer down the bottom here. Um, we can use a control structure which is like a big valve that, that regulates what height we let the water go at. And therefore we can let the water go through another tile drain pipe that's put 200 mil below the ground in a long line. And that nitrate filled water that's come out of your paddock then flows over a grassed way. Now, for mixed cropping like me, that's easy. That's really easy. And that's, that's the way I think I will do it. Drain water recycling, the US is only just really starting on this. Um, go faster. You are starting, starting on this, they probably haven't got it right yet and you need perfect, um, you need the perfect farm to do it. Okay, that's the real problem. Skip ahead. So what are we doing with this? 
um, you know, part of Nuffield is you go find it out and you bring it home and you share it. It's what we did. We had a big field day. Soil Max came out from America and we, we did all these kind of things and showed all our farmers around what we could do with these things, what, what we could do with this tile plow and how easy it was. Um, but why? Why are we doing it? That is the paddock from the video. That's the canola crop the following year. No fungicide, 120 units of nitrogen. Absolutely horrible management of a canola crop if you've ever grown canola. Um, that's great, but the following year, and CVH needs to come and see me because I'm going to need a bunk, that same paddock pumped out 10.2 tonne of wheat, of red wheat of, of Acroc. Okay, so all of a sudden my land use has gone from running a cow, growing a grass seed crop because that's all it could sustain, to now I can just about grow anything. In fact, I'm growing uh, Benitas vetch on it at the moment. Now, vetches shouldn't grow where I am. We can also start growing Persians because the Persians put their roots down deeper all of a sudden. The big story here is we can cut and harvest the Persian. Um, so we actually get a cut of silage as well as a seed crop now because our roots are deeper and they finish properly. That Persian, we then, that Persian silage, we then feed through cattle, there's their growth weights. We use an opti way to manage them, we know what they're doing. And then we put it into the Coles Graze program. So by having a tile drain, being able to grow Persian, I've now got a contract for 12 months of the year with Coles. I'm one of three that have got that in Western Australia. So that's about it. Um, there's a lot more in the report about, um, you know, obviously the more technical side of it, but that probably shows you what, what I've done with it um, and what use it's been. The picture there is of an almond tree, if you've ever seen it. Um, so I've got 150 independent almond trees, so they're self-pollinating almond trees. And if you told me that I was planting almonds with the view of planting a large almond orchard, when I started this, I would have laughed at you. But this is what we're doing because we can now plant a tree. Okay, thank you very much.